Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the ninth meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I welcome uh, all members, welcome our witnesses and welcome uh, guests in the gallery. And I can, uh, can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other uh, electrical devices so they don't interfere with the committee's work. Uh, item uh, one uh, on the agenda, we are continuing our inquiry into internationalising Scottish business and we have two panels uh, with us this morning. I'd like to welcome our first panel from Scottish Development International and UK Trade and Investment and introduced, uh, starting on my left, Jane Martin, who's the Managing Director, Customer Operations at Scottish Enterprise, uh, Neil Francis, Director of International Operations at SDI, and Guy Warrington, Director of English Regions UK Trade and Investment. Welcome to you all. Uh, now, we've got about up to about 90 minutes uh, for uh, the session. We have a bit of ground to cover, uh, and I would uh, remind members, as I always do, if they can keep their questions short and to the point, and uh, answers that are as short and to the point as possible would be helpful in getting through the topics in the time available to us. And it might be helpful if... Uh, People answering their answering uh, so people asking questions rather could direct their questions at a particular individual uh, initially and then if uh, you want to come in in response to a question addressed to somebody else if you just catch my eye I will bring you in as best I can and as time allows. Um, I wonder if I, I could just start off um, in relation to um, picking up some of the evidence we've we've heard and maybe ask this initially to you Mr Francis from, from uh, SDI. Some of the evidence we've heard um, is around the, the dual role that SDI has you know, involved in attracting inward investment to Scotland where our, our track record of course has been, been very good. You have a, a, another role that's about um, promoting Scottish exports and internationalisation which really is the focus of this inquiry. I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you uh, deal with these two roles which, which at times must involve some degree of conflict and how you split the resources of SDI in terms of the budget, in terms of staff time between these two distinct but complementary roles. Okay, uh, thank you very much Chairman. I think uh, at the heart of it is Scotland's international competitiveness. That's what's going to drive our future prosperity and growth as an economy and uh, both attracting additional inward investment and supporting our existing company base to internationalise are very critical components of driving that international competitiveness. And, and the reason uh, they are linked closely is because many of our largest exporters are also inward investors. So many of the companies we attract here from an inward investment point of view come to Scotland not simply to access our domestic market, which is very small, but to use it as a launch pad for Europe, the Middle East and Africa. So that's the important thing. The way we, we kind of balance our efforts between the two is really about understanding where our priorities are and understanding where we truly can be internationally competitive. So as many of the committee will know, we tend to take a sectoral approach. So we plan our activity sector by sector, whether that be food and drink, financial and business services, tourism, etc. And what we know from that is that the balance of opportunity from inward and trade is different sector by sector. So for example, if you think of the financial and business services, Principally, our opportunity is, is on the inward side there. So our balance of our resources there would be on attracting inward investment. Whereas if you think of food and drink, the balance of our priorities lie in terms of trade, supporting our existing companies to grow their international revenues. So again, we would balance our resources there. So for each of our sector, we understand our priorities by subsector, so it's not simply talking about life sciences, it's understanding that within life sciences where we really are competitive are in things like medical devices and pharma services, and then understanding which of the markets around the globe 
that we really need to target. So again, if you look at the life science example, pharma services, we know the opportunities are in India, in South Korea, and in East and West Coast America and Japan. So we have that picture for each of our sectors. And when you put it together, then it allows us to understand where we should be placing our resources. Okay, thanks. So that answers your question. Yes, I mean, specifically, I mean, in terms of the, the, the budget split, have you any sense of how much of your budget would go on inward investment as opposed to export potential? <laughs> so, so I don't have that exactly uh, with me. Uh, we can provide that to the committee at a later date. So inward investment uh, is really about how we go around targeting and, and how we then attract uh, uh, the investor to come to Scotland. Part of that proposition sometimes involves providing the investor with a fina uh, financial incentive package. Not always, but sometimes it does. Now, uh, that doesn't, that comes from our RSA budget uh, so that's held elsewhere so we kind of draw on that as a need basis we don't kind of pre-allocate that at the beginning of the year whereas our, our trade investment tends to be more allocated at the beginning of the year and in the current financial year uh, an estimate of what we're spending on our trade effort excluding the cost of our staff resources is circa 11 million but we, we will confirm the precise numbers to you uh, in due course. I, d I wouldn't want to... Okay. Uh, okay, and 11 million out of a total budget of how much? Uh, sorry, I don't have that figure in, 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 in my head. Oh, guys, no, that, that wouldn't be the correct uh, <laughs> number. <laughs> S sorry, uh, I apologise. I don't have. That. You don't have that figure. That's fine. Figure we can we can we can follow that up. Follow that up. Okay, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Can I just just move on to to to, to a slightly broader point and maybe bring in Mr. Mr. Warrington to get your initial comments on this? Um, we've heard a lot in in the inquiries we've gone through about how UK uh, and SDI work together, and, and the feedback we've had is that generally it's a good working relationship, and and. You know, those of us who went to Saudi Arabia saw on the ground how uh, the, the local teams work together. But we still hear concerns that there are some gaps, that the UK TI programmes are less visible in Scotland than they might be in other parts uh, of uh, the UK. And there is an issue perhaps about complementarity uh, of the, the programmes offered by UK TI and SDI. Maybe you can start off, Mr Warrington, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring in SDI. I mean, what is your sense of how UKTI works together with SDI and what might be done to try and improve that? Well, I mean, I, I think we have an excellent working relationship with SDI, as indeed we have with the, uh, the other two governments, the Welsh Government and the Government of Northern Ireland. Um, people who talk about the lack of visibility of UKTI in Scotland, I think that might just be an issue of how things are branded at the point of delivery. Um, because uh, we do not s sell our products actively as UKTI in Scotland. We rely on SDI to, to sell our product range, so to speak, and to sell what is the real thing we bring to the table, which is our overseas network, um, as part of what they deliver. So I, I, I imagine it is quite conceivable uh, that people will actually enjoy UKTI services and certainly use the services of our overseas network and not see that as being a UKTI service. They would see it maybe as a British government service, maybe as an SDI service, or you know, my, my background is in the Foreign Office, they may think they're just getting, em uh, getting assistance from the embassy um, and not see any UKTI branding there. So I think there's a danger of conflating whether you are aware that something's a UKTI product with actually whether that UKTI offer is available to all Scottish companies, which it is. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, Mr Francis, I, mean, I don't know who, who, you can choose between you who, who you would rather answer the questions, entirely up to you. I would agree with that. Um, you know, Scottish Development International is the lead agency for trade and investment in Scotland. It's a partnership in its own right, you know, between Scottish Enterprise Highlands and Enterprise 
Islands and Islands Enterprise and the Scottish Government. And you know, one of the things that we've been doing over the past couple of years, actually since the last Enterprise Committee uh, inquiry in 2010, is really trying to ramp up the presence of SDI as a brand to be that one-stop shop, if you like, to be that kind of prime agency where you can access all kinds of trade and investment support. So if I, if I may just add, add a couple of points there, Chairman. Uh, I think Guy's absolutely right. The, the, the important thing is that uh, the, the customers, the, the companies in Scotland are getting the full range of support available to help them to maximise the impact of their internationalising efforts. So, for example, uh, last year, uh, SDI supported 2,708 companies in Scotland with 5,300 interventions. UKTI supported 1,400 companies in Scotland with 3,000 interventions, and we supported over 600 companies together. So, you, you know, I think that's quite a lot of evidence, as Guy suggested, that, you know, the, the issue of our companies getting the right kind of support across the full range of products and services we can offer, then I, I think the answer is yes. Our approach is not to duplicate. We try our hardest not to duplicate products that are currently available through UKTI. Uh, it's a, about complementarity. The other thing I would say on the general relationship, Guy is absolutely right, it's a very constructive uh, uh, and positive relationship. We have a, a six monthly CEO summit that is between the CEO of SDI, Welsh Government, Invest in Northern Ireland, London and Partners and UKTI. They are working much better now to set the strategic agenda, identify strategic issues that need to be tackled and then supporting this, the CEO group. There is the partnership forum that meets quarterly comprising of the same organisations to do the heavy lifting of, of looking at those issues and coming up with solutions to ensure we deliver better services to our customers. If I could just add one point. You talked about improvements. Um, obviously, on the back of the Wilson Review last year, the Scottish Government and the UK Government um, have agreed a joint approach, and we have a joint working group in place um, involving all the parties, Scotland Office, Scottish Government, UKTI, SDI, um, FCO, and we're going to actually come together to develop a joint action plan, to, obviously to make some improvements, taking, taking account of some of the things that came out of the Wilson Review. And that, we should have that out in the next kind of few weeks. All right, thank you. I'm going to bring in Dennis Robertson who wants to follow up on some of these points. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. And uh, maybe just to pick up the point that you've just uh, raised with regard to the Wilson Review. Um, yes, we, 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 and I understand there's a lot of dialogue going on and a lot of meetings going on and the, there's a lot of uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, complementary uh, sort of unity that's going on. But in regard to this working group, who's leading it, Jane? Who's leading the working group? Who's actually taking it forward? Who chairs it? I, I, do you know who chairs it? I, well, I went to the first meeting of it and it didn't have a chair. We were just... Uh, <laughs> All right, so, so no one's so leading. So it's a genuinely collective endeavour no, I mean, conducted. That, that, no, no, no. I can, I can hear what you're saying. A collective endeavour. Uh, we're looking at someone taking a lead here. This is really important in terms of how we, we move forward, taking some of the recommendations from the Wilson Review. Surely someone is taking the lead. I mean, I can certainly find out who's chairing the group for you. I'm sorry, I'm not aware. But when it comes to Scotland, Scottish Development International, SDI, is taking the lead. So it's down to us to make sure that we work with the UK government, with UKTI, with other partners across Scotland to make sure that it makes sense for Scottish businesses that we're joining stuff up. In terms of an individual taking the lead? Well, my responsibility as, as a newly appointed post as Managing Director yeah. of Customer Operations is actually I lead on the whole service alignment piece from a Scottish yeah. Enterprise perspective. So it's a key part of my new role, actually, to help make that happen. Obviously, with Neil and some of my colleagues in SDI and also people um, across Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise around other areas of business support. Because I think the important thing here is to join it up from a growth perspective. Exporting is really important, but there's also aspects like innovation, funding, all 
all these kind of things. And the more that we can join it up from an end user, i.e. a business's perspective, the better. So the, the whole body of work that I'm leading, if you like, from a Scottish enterprise perspective in terms of trying to get that alignment agenda much further up the agenda. OK, I understand that. Um, with regard to the Wilson Review itself, with the recommendations, uh, maybe maybe come to Guy on this one. Uh, with some of the recommendations within the Wilson Review, um, uh, how which ones do you think are, are the ones that we should be moving forward with, in, in terms of priorities? Well, I think our attitude has been that um, we need to, as I say, I mean, I think I think the most important thing that's come out of it in a practical sense so far, is the formation of this group where we can sit down and discuss with each other what are the areas we can take forward um, collectively and how we can improve our cooperation on, 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 on trade work. So I, I, that's the most practical outcome of this of, of, of the review so far. My concern is that we've got a group of people having a, a conversation and dialogue, but there just seems to be rudderless in terms of the lead at the moment because we haven't identified who's leading it, uh, and you've already had a meeting. Um, with, with regard to one, one of the recommendations was this, uh, the, the, this concept of a, a single portal because there seems to be, uh, for a lot of the companies out there, um, a lack of direction or a maze of pathways to try and gain information. Do you support the idea of the single portal, Guy? Um, well, this is a universal uh, issue, and it just doesn't it doesn't just apply uh, to Scotland. Um, you know, we've had a review um, in the UK to set up uh, what came out as the Business Growth Service. I think you do need to have a portal where people can access the entirety of business support by going to one place. So in the UK, that is what we have in the form of the growth, sorry, in, in, in England, what we have in the form of growth hubs. But I also think there should be a no wrong door policy, i.e. you shouldn't have to force people to go to that place to get everything they need. So there needs to be a place where people can get everything they need, but you also need to accept that people will go in through other doors, and then they should be taken to the same place, i.e. they should be taken to the same process where they're analysed and a diagnostic takes place of what their needs are, and they are fed out to the people who can help them. So, sorry not to give you a straight yes no, 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 answer no, to that, I, I, but, but it's, 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 it's <laughs> I, a slightly... I'm not sure I expected one. Um, the, 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 the end of the day, uh, I mean, yeah, it is about customer choice, but <clears throat> as the customer is looking for some degree of direction in terms of how they move forward with the potential of, say, growth. They're looking at you know, the how or who to go to, and whether it's a signposting uh, or not. Um, at the moment, it's very confusing for them. Uh, what's your opinion on this, Neil? I, mean, I, th I think I, I agree with, with Guy and your comment <coughs> there uh, in terms of it's about growth. A, uh, internationalization is one of the key drivers of growth but it's not the only driver we know that leadership and innovation are also important so I think you know it's about understanding around uh, the ease of access not only to international support but to support to enable the whole kind of issues that that lead to growth to be uh, addressed uh, I think I also agree with Guy that there should be no wrong door. I, I think it's really important that no matter which way people come in, that they get the, the, the services and, and the guidance that's uh, required. So, so that, that would be my feeling. Do you acknowledge or do you agree with the concept of having this sort of single portal? to enable the, the information to be gathered in one point so people can access it and then make choice. I th I've, sorry, Jane. No, I, I, yes, I absolutely agree. And I, I think if I can bring the committee's attention to a couple of pieces of work that's underway in Scotland. First of all, we have a business portal programme in Scotland. Um, the URL is business.scotland.gov.uk. And that is essentially meant to be a portal where um, businesses can go in and access a range of support that's available across the public sector. 
ourselves, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Business Gateway, local authorities, Skills Development Scotland have all been involved in that piece of work. Um, it's, it's, it's under development, it's already live, and we will continue to improve on that. It's actually about to be um, integrated, if you like, into the Scottish Government's MyGovScot um, uh, portal, if you like, which is a one-stop shop for all services, either citizens or businesses. So there's work underway there. As part of our working group in that, we also have done some work around this no wrong door idea. So if you go to business.scotland, you should get access to all the information that's available across multiple sites, including the UK site. Incidentally, we link into gov.uk. Um, but equally, if you go to Business Gateway, who don't necessarily offer direct exporting support, they will, they will direct you to the SCI website and the Scottish Enterprise website. So we've been doing both at the same time. It's not absolutely perfect, and it is, it is a journey that we're on. Um, uh, but, so the principle, I think, is absolutely correct, but it's something that we're very actively working on across uh, kind of public sector Again, partnership. I, I understand that. Is Scottish Enterprise uh, taking the lead in this, and do you manage that uh, website to ensure that the information is correct and continue to be updated? So Scottish Enterprise was in the lead for this. Um, the responsibility has transferred over to the online services division of the Scottish Government in order to merge the business and the citizen side of things, and that happened just under a year ago. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Fine. Okay. I've got uh, three members who want to come in, following up some of these points. Start with Chick Brody. Good morning. <clears throat> in terms of the working group, uh, do we assume from the fact that you're working together? that your strategies in terms of products, services, are aligned? Because if I look at UKTI in terms of the, uh, the London, the UK government uh, has an emphasis, for example, on defence sales, which we don't have. So what is the strategy that comes out of the working group re reference products and services? Guy. I think it's probably a bit early to be saying what the outcomes are of a group that's only met once to discuss what it might discuss. Um, if you didn't know what you wanted to do. Sorry? Why did you set it up if you didn't know what you wanted to do? Um, I think what we wanted to do is identify... I mean, the, the, the remit of the group is to identify areas where we can cooperate and work together more closely. It's but not... Uh, so, I mean, we haven't, like, discussed the alignment of sectors or anything like that at, at, yet so far. Okay. Just if you wanted to add, that, that, that actually is quite strong working at a sectoral level. You might want to say a bit more about that, Neil. I, I think, from my perspective, you've got two slightly different components of your question, Chick. One is about where should we place our priorities. So clearly, we have a sectoral approach in Scotland, uh, and increasingly uh, at the UK level, there is also uh, an industrial sectoral approach. But clearly, in some areas, our strengths in Scotland are slightly different to the strengths elsewhere in the UK. And I think that's fine. And I think it's right that we should focus on Scotland's strengths and Scotland's priorities. So, so that's the first part. The, the second part of your question was then the products and services and interventions to support companies to exploit those strengths in terms of international markets. And I think... In the main, those are applicable across all sectors. So, so I think it's slightly different. And in terms of our product portfolios, I think we are fairly strongly aligned and there's very little duplication. And just if I may follow up on that then, because one of the, at, at a previous um, <coughs> committee meeting, we heard that those that represent, and this may apply to UKTI and, and, and SDI abroad, they have to be experts on life sciences on the Monday, energy on the Tuesday, uh, and so on. I mean, what, what in, in terms of coverage, what expertise is available from the UKTI, for example, or do you have the same problem that we don't really have you know, levels, high levels of expertise out internationally? Uh, perhaps understandably, that, that uh, can entertain the interests from a particular sector in China, in India, or what have you? Well, um, uh, the degree to which uh, embassies have, I mean, because my, my background, as I said, it, it, I have run overseas posts and trade mission, uh, trade 
sections. The degree to which we can provide sectoral expertise does depend to a large extent on the size of the embassy concerned. So the two examples that you provided, China and India, um, when, we went, when my last posting was the UAE, um, we did have uh, the critical mass to be able to cover all the sectors that were important um, to those markets. So we can do that. Uh, we can do that in, in, in posts where we have the critical mass to do it. We organise ourselves on a sectoral basis overseas. We organise ourselves on a sectoral basis um, in, in, in our headquarters and, and in the English regions which I, I run. We also organise ourselves so that there is sectoral expertise uh, available on all sectors in all regions. But what you say is true. If you go to a small post and it's got a two-man trade section, then those people do have to be jacks of all trades and, and, and bring in the expertise from other parts of the organisation. Could I just add something? Because I think it's an excellent question. Uh, and as Guy said, it is a challenge, especially in, in uh, areas where we have few people. So, so there's two things that's really important for us. One is to continue to focus on our priorities. So, so be very clear what are the priority sectors in what market so that we have an opportunity to build... Uh, an expertise to support those particular sectors. The second thing is how we work across our agencies in field, in market, so that whilst we might not have that expertise, if UKTI has it, then you know we can make best use of that. The other thing uh, is one of the things that we have been doing uh, is uh, listening to our industrial base so if you think of food and drink and the uh, work that scotland food and drink has been doing in establishing a very clear international export plan focused on 15 priority markets then what we have been doing collaboratively working with scottish government the industry themselves is in those in seven of those priority markets we are putting in a dedicated food and drink specialist someone who will absolutely have that knowledge so that's rolling out at the moment we've already got specialists in china canada uh, one is just being hired in france so they'll get rolled out to seven of those markets so that'll be really interesting for us to see the additional impact that will make in the next few years on the performance of the food and drink industries exporting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Lewis McDonald. Yeah, I wanted to pursue one or two questions around other partnerships that you have with other agencies. So um, I, I wonder if we can start with the relationship with SCDI. And um, we heard from them early in our inquiry that they had previously been uh, in, uh, partners with SDI in delivery of the, the market visit programme. And that was one that UKTI had delegated the responsibility to yourself. So it was, um, I wonder if you, what your reflections might be on the fact that at the last op occasion they, they chose not to bid for that uh, tender and, and felt it wasn't a tender that they could actively engage with. Yes, uh, we, were, we were quite disappointed uh, that SCDI chose not to proceed with that tender opportunity. They had previously obviously secured that contract to deliver trade missions on behalf of SDI. Um, the main change that we made at that point in time, really in this back of, on the back of this feedback about clarity, was that we wanted all missions to be branded under the SDI banner. But you know that was open for, for, for SCDI and others to tender within that basis. The tender was awarded to a BES Group, and since uh, it was awarded, we have delivered, I think, nine um, cross-sectoral missions to different markets. 120 odd companies have been on those on those missions. So we were disappointed because SCDI um, are, were a very important partner for us. And actually, we've we've already sought out uh, some uh, discussions with SCDI about the future. I'm meeting Ross McEwen actually in early uh, April. And uh, the part of my team that's responsible for cross-sector missions and running overseas 
exhibitions and that kind of thing, is actually looking at working with SCDI and the Scottish Chambers to create a bit of a community of practice, if you like, in Scotland, to actually get in place a much stronger partnership where we meet once a quarter, share forward plans and, and engage in a much more strategic dialogue rather than procurement supplier type of relationships, engage in a much more strategic dialogue about the future and how we can complement each other. I guess one of the common things we've heard uh, when Guy Warrington replied to the first question about UKTI's visibility, his answer was, well, actually, a lot of this is branded as SDI and therefore isn't visible. And I think what you've described is SCDI chose not to pursue that tender, perhaps because you'd said it has to be branded as SDI, even if you're delivering it. Is there a, is there a common thread there? Is, is, I mean, clearly, there's a, there's a, a view from much of the evidence that exporters need to know who they're dealing with and they want it simple but 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 is over 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 branding by SDI what other people can do or are doing is is does that muddy the water in any way I'm I'm not aware of any evidence or, or, or feedback that that has muddied the waters I'm hoping it's quite the contrary um, but but equally, if if aspects of the market are wanting to do some of these things themselves, that would be something that we would welcome because it means that the public sector doesn't fund it and absolutely open and up for having a, a dialogue about how we might want to make that work in future. Uh, Lewis, can I just add a couple of comments just more widely about our partnership? We have a, a, a fantastic scale of ambition for Scotland in terms of our international competitiveness. Now, for us to, to deliver that ambition, we need uh, organisations across the private sector, across the whole gamut of the public sector, all to contribute to that. And the way we see that you know, you'll end up with the whole being greater than some of the parts is for each organisation to play to their strengths, to focus on their specific role that they can play and where they can add the value and that's something you know we're very passionate about and, and something that we need to carry on working with all of the partners to actually mobilise as much momentum, resources and effort we can muster around improving Scotland's international competitiveness. I mean, at a UK level, um, obviously there's some interesting work going on with the British Chambers of Commerce and the role of the Chambers Network in this space. We're quite fortunate that we've got Nora Senior, who's the chair of the Scottish Chambers of Commerce and also um, British Chambers. And I've already engaged with Nora around, you know, what are the lessons that we can learn in Scotland around that? I don't have the answers yet, but what are the lessons that we could learn? Is there anything there that we could apply in order to create more, more impact, if you like? So we will continue that dialogue. Coming back to the relationship with UKTI for a moment. Uh, we heard from Brian Wilson the other week that um, the, the, there are, and indeed in his report, there are examples of uh, places where SDI and UKTI co-locate uh, and that that's a very successful model in some cases. But there are other examples where they're in the same city or in the same country and they're not co-located. I wonder if uh, we could have the benefit of your reflections on, on the different experiences of co-location and, 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 and otherwise, does it make a significant difference? Uh, and if so, is it something that you would want as a, as a standard? Well, it's not for me to say whether it should be a standard. Um, SDI will decide how they, how they uh, allocate their resources. But I can say that um, when I was in Dubai, we were co-located. Um, and to go back to the question about uh, people having to be jacks of all trades or have a specialism, it was very clear to me that the small SDI team benefited massively from sitting right next door. I mean, it wasn't just a co-location in the sense of being in the same embassy building. They were, they were in the same part of the building. And if they didn't know the answer to something, there were 20 other people sitting outside who they could access. Um, and I think whilst the embassy buildings will always be open to, to, to SDI to use, it's obviously much more of a instinctive reaction to use them if you are actually in the embassy in the first place. So I think if you want to sweat the assets, so to speak, and make the most of the, the UKTI overseas presence, the easiest and best way to do that is to co-locate. But it's not for, not for UKTI to insist upon that or to say that it should happen. But uh, where, where it does happen, it works well. I've never been uh, in a post where it wasn't the case, so I wouldn't want to comment on that. I think you know, my reflections would be uh, 
along similar lines to Guy. I think there are a lot of advantages of co-location. However, I think the more important thing is how we work collectively in particular markets. So in some markets, we're not co-located, but our, our, our working together is very, very joined up. Uh, in other markets, there's room for improvement. Ultimately, you, you know, there is uh, uh, complete agreement from the leadership of UKTI and the leadership of SDI that we have to work collaboratively uh, and joined up in all our markets. But ultimately, you know, to an extent, it comes down to individuals on the ground. Uh, the other reflection I have is there are lots of advantages in terms of being part of the FCO platform in particular markets and, and the advantages that bring. However, there are some constraints with that. So uh, security is very, very important. Uh, and sometimes when we are wanting to develop uh, opportunities for, for businesses to have quick, easy touchdown space and so on and so forth. Sometimes there are constraints around that operating with, within certain environments. So, so that's uh, something we, we, we take into consideration on, on occasions. If, if I could just to add one thing, maybe more for the future, there's obviously other types of co-location and I was really interested to see in the programme for government this idea of One Scotland partnerships. You know, so how do we actually coalesce in a specific overseas market from the perspective of SDI, Scottish Government, universities, Creative Scotland, Visit Scotland. So there's an opportunity, again, depending on the market, for us to really think about, OK, how else might we join up in order to create a bigger impact, create more of a presence, more of a buzz around what's going on in Scotland, again, depending on the opportunities around that market and the objectives and what we're trying to achieve. So again, early days, but there is another opportunity around co-location that we might want to consider for Scotland for the future. That's that's clear. I think I think though, I, I guess my question then would be: there are two; these are two different things, um, which might, in some circumstances, pull you in two different directions. How will how will how how will SDI or um, SDI's uh, uh, sponsors make that decision? Make the judgment in each market: what is the appropriate uh, way to proceed? In other words, do you go for a larger? more diverse Scotland presence, or do you go for a, a, a co-location around trade with, with UKTI? Clearly there are, you can't do both, uh, or at least in some cases you might, but in other cases you, you, you won't be able to. And it's, it's obviously very very early days, but, but my view would be we'd take that decision based on the opportunity. So it depends on the market and the, and the opportunity. Case, case yeah. by case, yeah. <coughs> uh, Okay, Gordon MacDonald. Yeah, just a couple of points in relation to... Um, what you said about having good relationships and joint working and working collaboratively, etc. Um, there was a report came out recently by the European Union entitled Supporting the Internationalisation of SMEs. And it says in terms of exporting, there's considerable scope for improving the performance of UK SMEs. The report says that 21% of small and medium-sized enterprises in UK export are, uh, as compared with the average of 25% among 27 countries in the, UK, the EU. So, and then it goes on to highlight the lack of support or the lack of the take up of support of uh, financial or non financial nature compared to other EU countries. So, who is ultimately responsible for trade support in the UK? And why is it not as effective as other EU countries? Well, um for the UK, uh, I mean, I have to be careful. I don't want to get into a constitutional minefield here. I mean, trade is a trade is a devolved matter, um, um, uh, and we have devolved the interface, the ITA, what we call the ITA, International Trade and Trade Advisor aspects of that, um, and therefore this is a shared enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the product range we have is a national one, um, so we deliver it nationally, um, and obviously the overseas network is a national one. And so ultimately responsibility, if it lies anywhere, lies with UKTI for the underperformance of the UKTI as a whole um, uh, in terms of exports. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, it's actually a mixed picture in terms of exports. Um, and I think it's also um, 
not strictly true uh, to say that you know that there is a problem with the take up of services by um, by by UK firms. I think it's worth pointing out that uh, over the last three years, UKTI has increased the amount of firms it interacts with. So I don't know how old that survey was. Um, from around 25,000 companies to 50,000 companies. So our reach is growing. Um, in, in the mid-sized sector, we've gone from dealing with 1,000 to 3,000 mid-sized businesses. As I say, 97% 90, 90, of our customers are either SMEs or mid-sized businesses, and we've doubled the size of our reach uh, in that sector. So I think there's, some quite good, there's a quite a good tale to tell of the government's engagement with export. Um, you know the amount of resources that the government has put into into export promotion and into business support assistance has grown quite significantly. Um, we're not seeing quite yet the sort of numbers we would like to see in export growth to get us to our our, our, our real target, which is to double exports in the UK from 500 uh, billion to a trillion, um, because uh, that would require growth rates of around 10, 12 percent. But we are seeing some growth, and we have to put that growth in the context of a, of a recent economic situation where a lot of our main export markets, in particular in Europe, have suffered some serious difficulties. And take into account the fact that a lot of what you do when you are providing business support, when you're trying to convince companies to start exporting, the impact you feel in terms of actual exports is not immediate. This is a long-term play. Uh, we need to get the next generation of exporters exporting. We need to get 100,000 new companies exporting in the UK. These are quite stretching targets, um, but our, our levels of aspiration are high and the resources we're putting into it are high and the amounts of companies that we're dealing with are growing. Could I just add something, uh, please? I mean, I, I agree with, with, with Guy's uh, analysis. Uh, you'll, members will be familiar with the Scottish Government's target also to increase our, our, uh, the value of, of our exports by 50% by 2017. And the recently published Global Connection Survey 2013 shows roughly, you know, just a tad under 28 million. And, you know, we're on the right trajectory to hit that 50%. Uh, but obviously, uh, there's no room for complacency. See? And uh, if you think of exporting about helping our existing exporters to generate more from their international activities by supporting them to go to different markets and supporting them to take products for the first time to, to market, and, and, and we've talked a bit about that. The other element which is relevant to your question is we need to increase the total number of companies exporting, and especially companies exporting for the first time. And as Guy said, that is a hard road to go down. I mean, it takes a determination, it takes commitment, and it takes resources. Now, what we do know is through our smart exporter program that ran from 2010 to 2014, we have supported 4,700 companies to get started on that journey. Now, clearly, we need to continue to build momentum around that, and we have taken the learning from Smart Exporter, and we have got a new program that's just been launched to re, you know, just put more momentum into that whole new exporters piece. So, so we are very committed to doing that. Just a little thing about the stats, because you know statistics are wonderful things, aren't, aren't, aren't they? So if you, dig, uh, if you look at the uh, performance country by country, what you will notice is that the UK's performance is in line with the other large countries of the EU, i.e. the France and the Germany's. And, and I think I'm right, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and, and some of the best performing countries are the smaller countries. And part of that, I think, is if you look at how many international borders a country has and how close they are. So the smaller the country with the more borders, the easier it is to kind of trade internationally. Uh, because if you look at the UK data, Northern Ireland has 30% of their SMEs exporting. And the main reason for that is you're, you're within 90 minutes of an international border. So, so 
I'm not saying we, we shouldn't redouble our efforts to increase the number of new exporters, but I would say, you know, the geography is something to do with the statistics. Right, thanks. Um, John McAlpin. Oh, thank you very much, Convener. It's kind of to, to develop that theme, I wonder if you could explain to us how SDI services and Scottish Enterprise and HIE account management work together. Sorry, Joan, could you repeat the question? Please? If you could Sorry. explain how SDI um, and Scottish Enterprise account management systems right. work together, okay. how, how do you work with account no. managed companies, from <coughs> great, HIE and uh, great, Scottish Enterprise? Great, great question. So, uh, so we work in the same way with SE's account management approach and Highlands and Islands enterprise account manage uh, approach. And in summary, what we are are the international specialists to those organisations' account managers. So as you'll be familiar, the account manager's uh, focus is on engaging strategically with the, the, the company, identifying the challenges that they have to their growth, whether that be innovation, whether it be organisation development, whether it be international or leadership. And then the account manager's job is to draw in the specialists from around the organisation, and in our case, the international trade advisors from SDI, to then work with the company in the context of that overall framework on the international X uh, component. So that's how, how, how we would work. Quite a lot of exporters um, are not account managed and uh, this is an issue that I've raised before in committee um, in uh, the south of Scotland in particular, uh, De Vries and Galloway, the percentage of total SE growth exporters uh, is just 1.8%, which is the lowest in Scotland. Can you tell me what you're doing to address that? Um, that is what many see, people see as a failing. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer that, actually, because one of the other things um, that I'm responsible for from a senior perspective is uh, how we work across the south of Scotland. Um, I, I've already met with um, senior people within both Dumfries and Galloway Council and Borders Council. And one of the challenges, so, so that stat that, that you quoted really is in line with the kind of number of growth companies in that area. So I think one of the underlying things here is about how we actually change the business base across Across, across, across the south of Scotland. And what we're going to be working with both local authorities on is essentially looking at, first of all, a piece of analysis to genuinely understand the barriers, um, the company base, not just in terms of turnover and that kind of thing, and how we actually start shifting that, uh, that in terms of ambition, in terms of, again, numbers of exporters, international mindset, that kind of thing. I suspect we've not done the analysis. I suspect it's going to be a long-term game, a bit like uh, what Neil was talking talking about earlier, but what we're doing just now is aligning, putting the partnerships in place to have the right conversations, really get underneath the skin of what's happening in that area, and then look collectively about what's our response. So, just Could I just add something, Joan, because I think it's a really, really great question. So, uh, if you look at our, our account management portfolio as a whole, <coughs> around 65% are exporters across the piece and as you pointed out in terms of Dumfries and Galloway is sitting at around 50 51 percent so we've got more of a job to do with the account management portfolio as a whole but we've got more of a job to do with in Dumfries and Galloway with the growth companies that are there and to support them to get to be internationally trading uh, and we are absolutely committed to that and you know, we just have to redouble the efforts we have with working with our growth companies to take them through the stages of an international journey. And what we do know is, you, you know, that journey falls into three bits, awareness and ambition, and then you've got capability and capacity, and then exploitation and entry. And for many of our companies, the main barrier is around ambition and awareness. Uh, and that's hard to change someone's awareness. You can do re relatively okay, but to transform someone's ambition is quite hard work. And, and you know, that's an area we need to focus on. The, the other thing I would say is beyond the growth, 
companies. You know, we've talked about the need to support more exporters in general, and we've been looking at new approaches. And one of the uh, approaches is around uh, collaborative solutions. And we've been piloting, again, a collaborative solution approach in the food and drink industry. And that's all about identifying a clear market opportunity and then bringing together a group of companies <coughs> who can then attack that market opportunity that they might not have the scale or the wherewithal to do individually, but as a collective, they can then attack that opportunity and use aggregators to, to, to aggregate the, the, the offering to do the market. And you might have seen uh, some, some press commentary yesterday about the new Craft Beers Association, getting, I think it's member 15, and that has come out of that approach now. We've got a whole new trade association around a niche product, uh, working together to get into new markets and j just just a passing I heard last night in terms of what's it, when they calculate the the inflation figures new things that are in your basket of 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 items and craft beers now suddenly appeared in in people's basket of of items so new approaches that were really relevant to the rural community is something we 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 are targeting as well there's also a couple of specific actions underway as well as this underlying um, work to, un to understand the underlying business base and, and the reasons behind it. We've obviously worked with Dumfries and Galloway Council on their export week uh, in terms of being able to, to raise awareness with, within the area. Um, and uh, in addition, we're doing some work uh, around continuous professional development with business gateway staff in the area and, and, and others, uh, again, to make sure that those um, staff members that are engaging with businesses are aware of the opportunities and aware of the support that's available and actually aware of the right questions to ask in, or in order to stimulate that demand for more services. I certainly welcome all that. Now, it's been raised before that in the um, Highlands area, the um, turnover for a company that would qualify for account management is lower than if it's in the Scottish Enterprise area and obviously there's rural parts of uh, southern Scotland which are very similar to the Highlands but they have a higher barrier to reach because they're part of the Scottish Enterprise area. What are you doing to address that? Um, again, on the, back of, uh, on the back of that feedback and our conversations with Dumfries and Galloway, we've actually agreed to look at that threshold to see, um, f I think first of all we need to understand, is that going to make a difference? Is, uh, is the demand there in order to see the growth? But we're absolutely open to, to, to look at that. So you with would the perhaps local assess companies in a different way, assess their potential? Correct. Yeah. We want to assess companies on the basis of potential and opportunity for growth as opposed to um, kind of just thresholds and, and a kind of which which is a bit of a blunt instrument but to be clear that's kind of what we've been doing and I think sometimes when we put them um, the kind of information out about thresholds and things like that it sends the wrong message we're much more interested in growth opportunities and how we can assist them or how we can make sure that others are assisting them if it means that we're just a signposter so, okay thank you very much okay thanks I'm going to bring back in Chick Brody who's got a supplementary I think on this question well, well I had in fact you know my questions were slightly preempted, but um, I, I'm the European reporter on this committee. Um, one of the things we found, found in the visit to uh, Europe was each member state, which we're not yet, uh, has a small business envoy. Can you tell me, Guy, what your small business envoy does? Um, no. Okay. Let me talk about Europe then. On the basis of what may happen in two years' time, what contingency plans have been put in place regarding servicing the European marketplace? Sorry, can you say that again? I said, on the basis that we have a referendum on Europe in two years' time, mm -hmm. and in the event, maybe unlikely, we don't know, that uh, the UK pulls out of Europe, what contingency plans has the UK TI put in place and communicated with its partners in the working group, uh, or even before the working group, mm -hmm. what, the, what contingency plans are in place to, uh, should we come out of Europe? I'm not aware of any contingency plans of that sort. Okay. I'll come okay. back on that All right. question. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, Joanne Lamont. Oh, sorry. Lewis would all want to come in. Small question yeah. for Jane Martin in, in following up her, uh, her answers to 
uh, Joe McAlpin, and, and when you when you when you say you're looking again at ways to assist, presumably that's not only in the South of Scotland. Presumably that would apply uh, more broadly across the Scottish enterprise area. Would that be correct? Yes, but I think it's on a, really on a case by case basis, as opposed to a blanket piece. And what I was trying to get across is that what I think is more important is that we look at the growth opportunities and how we may be able to assist that growth, and that should be pan Scotland, absolutely. All right, John. Lennon. Thank you very much. I'm interested in, you spoke earlier about a joint action plan. I think I might be getting a couple of coming together of groups mixed up with each other. The one where we don't have a chair, and we're all sort of talking about what the issues are. Can you clarify who, what the purpose of that group is and who's on it? And secondly, the joint action plan group, what is that? Just to confirm in my own head what these two different okay. groups are. So the first um, joint working group is a working group that's been established on the back of the Wilson Review for uh, and, and it's been agreed by the Scottish Government and the UK Government that that would go ahead. Scotland Office, I'm, I know, I'm not sure who it is in the UK Government is represented, I'm not on the group, um, the UKTI and we have a, a member of, of strategy staff from SDI that's there to look at the outcomes of the Wilson Review and any actions that we need to take collectively in order to improve joint working. So that's that group only met once. <laughs> um, the, the joint working group that I was referring to earlier is something that we're setting up across the south of Scotland with Dumfries and Galloway Council and Borders Council to look at the business base there and how we collectively might support better growth across the business, business base in the region. So the group that's producing the joint action plan has only met once, but you're saying that the joint action plan will come out shortly? Yeah, that was, that was my understanding that it would be out in, in, the, in the spring. So. so from one meeting, there's going to be a joint action plan, agreed, signed off. I think it. I think it might be helpful for us to go away and give us some written evidence on the back of the work. It given we're, we're not individually represented on it, and neither of us are part of that group. To actually go back to the organisation, our organisation, and actually give you a, a written evidence about where the working groups are, what areas they're looking at, and the timescales for the publication of the action plan. It, 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 the question I was going to ask was, I think it's an issue about. Um, collaboration at the level that you're operating at, but also between the UK government and the Scottish government, and a sense that perhaps that these that devolution has ended up with two organisations competing with each other that, rather than working together. And I wonder if there are um, any comments you would have on how what collaboration there is between the Scotland Office and the Scottish government to make sure that that doesn't happen, that there's not a competition, but there is actually a I, I, I don't know that's one for, for me to answer. However, it's not it's not been my experience. Um, so last week, for example, we had a, a session on global sporting opportunities and UKTI came up and ran because it's not markets that we're in. So I, I, I don't I actually don't get a sense that that has been a, a blocker at all. But I don't know if you've just just to add to, to that following devolution back in 1999. Right. Nine, uh, there was a, a, a memorandum of, of understanding between the UK government and the devolved administrations, and I think uh, that is is managed through the, someone will correct me if I get the terminology wrong, the joint ministerial committees that meet on a regular basis. So I think that's the mechanism to ensure that those matters of mutual interest are, 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 are joined up. I suppose that, that I make a slightly different point, or which well. is that the Scotland office and the Scottish government presumably have a, a, a joint interest in companies in Scotland increasing export capacity. To what extent do they work together? Perhaps it would be useful if you could give us some evidence on that. It might be afterwards. Um, secondly, I wondered if you talked about food and drink and so on. I suppose I'm interested in the extent to which this is driven by business with the public sector coming in behind it, or to what extent it is driven by the fact the public sector organisations are there and bringing people together. So where there is co collaboration, for example, in food and drink, is this because individual companies have come together collectively and sort of made themselves their presence felt by the public agencies, or are there examples with the public organisations encouraging that cooperation at an industrial industry level. I think I think both. I, th I think you, you know, uh, in terms of the food and drink, you have the industry leadership group, which is Scotland Food and Drink, and they are very much 
driving that strategic agenda of what needs to be done to support, develop and grow the industry in Scotland. Now, for all the key sectors, there are industry leadership groups. Uh, and I think our role is, is twofold, as, as you said. One is to support and encourage the coming together of the group, and then also to respond as appropriate to the recommendations made by those uh, industry leadership groups. And I think food and drink in particular is a great example of how important the, the kind of industry leadership is there and, and how that can actually then really drive impact. And you, I think you're hearing from James Withers, but you know what, what they're doing around the ambition, they've already reached their export targets, they've stretched it further. You know, th there's a real sense of ownership, co-ownership, if you like, and I think that that's made a big, big difference in the food and drink. And just uh, finally, I'm interested in the role of colleges and universities. We all know that their individual initiatives very very often at a very local level between universities or colleges and um, international communication, perhaps bringing the students over or, or being based in other countries. What links are there or have been created between those kind of initiatives at college and university level with local businesses and how could you support colleges and universities to do more of that? So, for example, if there are going to be visitors to a college or university here, to what extent would local business be informed or is there a process for that and more generally is there a, is there a way in which people would be able to plug in to advice and support of that was happening? We, we treat universities and colleges as a sector when it comes to, to support. I don't know, Neil, if you want to talk a bit about what we're doing there. Yeah, I, mean, I've, I've, I think that's an excellent question because, you know, we see that as a, a really important and emerging role for our universities and colleges, how the universities and colleges can support, as we talked earlier about having everyone who can contribute to supporting our international competitiveness, how the universities and colleges can support businesses to internationalise. You know, we have uh, strong uh, international uh, communities of students. I think the cross-party group on China's talked a lot about how we can use the 9,000 Chinese students in Scotland to support companies who are thinking of going to China for the first time. Uh, I think we need to look also of where in the world that our universities have relationships and campuses and how they can be used in a, in a kind of pioneer sense to build business relationships that our companies can capitalise on. We've always got the issue of the alumni that's scattered around the, the world. So there's a lot I think our universities are doing to support our businesses, but I think there's even more collectively we can do to, to maximise the impact they can make. That sounds aspirational rather than practical. So what practically now, if I'm, organ if I'm sitting in a college in Glasgow, how am I supported if there's going to be international students or a project um, in another part of the world? How am I supported by any of you to make sure that local businesses are part of that? I suppose you're saying this would be a good thing. What practically is happening now organisationally to support these initiatives? Somebody would know where to go to get either help, advice, or to do the kind of things you're talking about? There's, well, there's two practical things, I think, that's going, on, that's going on just now. Firstly, you're right, it is at a local level. So, for example, uh, through the work that we've been doing in, in Renfrewshire, as an, as an example, around exporting work there and raising awareness, um, we've we've helped to facilitate work with the university there for the international marketing students to go in and work with local businesses around potential market opportunities because small businesses just don't have the time or the staff to do that amount of research. So we've facilitate, helped to facilitate that kind of link. It works very practically uh, and, and at a local level. In terms of um, you know, sharing plans and, and universities and colleges tapping into that, we have... Um, we actually have a, a kind of, a, a, again, it's online, but we have something called The Source, 
which is open to anyone in the public sector to join. And that's where we share both up-to-date information about Scotland's key sectors, the opportunities, um, but in addition, we also share all our forward plans of what's happening in the marketplace. So any trade missions that are going out, any exhibitions we're attending, that kind of thing. And that's open for all public sector partners to sign up to join. It's, it's an online tool and it's an information sharing one. I think it'd be very difficult for us to offer a kind of business to business support service for all colleges across Scotland from an international perspective. But having said that, we do treat colleges and businesses um, as colleges and universities as businesses from that perspective. So if they have a very kind of clear strategy and a, and a development plan and a growth plan that we can help with, then, they would, then we would do that. But it would probably be on a reactive basis when they're coming to us. So, so there isn't a, even a document where somebody says, well, I'm thinking of doing X, this is good practice, this is in the public domain, I'm just working my way through it. It is, if I happen to notice that the source exists... Or if the tool exists, then I might get advice. But there isn't something from your perspective that recognises the, the potential for this in terms of increasing international export business for export exports for local businesses. So, well, what we would do, so if that Renfrewshire example would be things like write that up as a case study, talk about it more, so that people are aware of it. I'm, I'm not aware of it all written down in, in a in a document. No, I, I'm not expecting big long documents, but I'm, I'm wondering if it's a good practice, if it's a good idea already heard how good an idea it is and there's all these people who could be really useful. It doesn't feel as if there's any rigour around it. In terms, it's just you're at the mercy then of individual um, colleges or universities with individual members of staff who think this might be a good idea to go and ask <coughs> any advice about how this is done. But it's not, it's not a strategy by the organisations represented here to, to improve exports for business. I suppose one of the other vehicles that we've got in terms of raising awareness from that is at a director level, we sit on all the community planning partnerships. So that Renfrewshire example that I talked about came through the work we were doing around the community planning partnerships, looking at the local economy and the local economic and the opportunities around that. So what we would do, we have a, all, all the kind of directors involved in that come together regularly and we share best practice and what's going on in our different patches, if you like, and then share that as appropriate. So I, I think that that would probably be the best vehicle for kind of sharing and, and putting it on the agenda. I sit in East Renfrewshire, for example, and um, I've been having conversations with the local authorities and other partners there about actually what does international mean to an area like East Renfrewshire? You know, how can we actually shift things? What 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 might we put in place? And a lot of my colleagues are doing that across um, the community planning partnerships. So I think it would probably work best at that local level and looking at how we can collaborate and put things in place around um, you know specific opportunities. One last very brief point on that then. We, we, we've um, had some discussion about the role at city region level of driving um, increased exports for business. You're saying that if you're sitting in a community partnership, you might raise it, but it isn't something that is routinely done to make sure that this is that there's that connection with city regions who might drive this kind of change. There isn't, there isn't a process that you're involved in. It's a matter for if you think of seeing it in one community partnership with somebody's to see it somewhere else. It's not the job of the person sitting in the community partnership to, to pursue that. Actually, it is. You know, so one of the things that we want to do uh, in part of our role in community planning partnerships is to uh, actually stimulate a, a more of a conversation around economic growth. And being a location director, a Scottish Enterprise Location Director, part of your role is actually to look at um, how can you work in partnerships to stimulate the conversations, the actions on the ground, that kind of thing, and you know, be flexible and fleet to foot in terms of what we might want to put in place. So every location director should be raising that as part of the conversations they're having in community planning partnerships partnerships. Um, I haven't done an analysis, but um, I, I would, we, we certainly, it's, it's part of our mandate, it's part of what we're asked to do. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just before I bring in Patrick Harvey, I want to go back to a, a point John Lamont raised a moment ago about um, workings with, with the Scotland office, because when we heard an evidence from the S SCDI about their trade mm -hmm. missions, they said sometimes these would be led by um, Scottish government ministers and sometimes by Scotland office ministers. Now that SDI are taking the lead on trade missions. Are you still involving Scotland office ministers in these? Uh, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of any Scottish uh, Scotland office ministers leading a trade mission in the recent past. 
what I would see is a, a general uh, a point is that for us across our partnership we we would be more than content for any of our partners to lead a trade mission uh, you you know that would be our, our general feeling on the subject so, so nobody's being territorial about this saying we don't we certainly don't want our, you because you're a Scotland office minister certainly from our perspective we wouldn't and you, you know the same would be you, you know you would have seen it in Saudi Arabia in terms of UKTI and, and, and SDI joint missions you know we we really want to ensure that whoever's leading the mission is best placed to capitalize on the opportunity and support the businesses to do that Okay, thanks. Okay, Chick wanted to come in with that. Follow uh, looking at the SE website last week, I saw there were no multi sector trade missions in the forward event plan. I wonder if you can clarify why that is, and also if you could clarify for me, are BES, who now are now handling and working for you, are they headquartered in Scotland? So I, th I, I think you are absolutely right. Uh, it's not. We, we don't have a forward uh, calendar of cross-sector missions. I think our experience in the recent past with cross-sector missions uh, has been that sometimes they're hard to recruit for and sometimes that the uh, expectations of all the companies on it haven't been fully met. So we've been reflecting on that and we are in the process of refocusing how we use our cross-sector missions and we think there are two areas in which they can work very well going forward. One is focusing them to support first-time exporters and these would generally be focused on near markets for first-time exporters. And then the second uh, area is focusing them on uh, markets that have very different business environments so that there's something common the, com the, the, the companies all need to deal with and that would be the business environment. And we're focusing these on fast growing markets and these would be the markets of China, India and the Middle East. So that's how we're going to proceed going forward in terms of where BES is headquartered I'm sorry Chick I don't know I don't think they're headquartered in Scotland I don't have the details about BE group on me but <laughs> I no I don't I, I don't, don't think, think they're they are either, which is why I asked the question I don't think they had, it, I it was wonder, an EU it would I wonder if the explanation EU. that Neil has just given uh, in terms of why this has happened is because we've changed the whole arrangement and there's a different I'm sure that you're driving the strategy, but I'm sure the BES have an input to that. And far for, from it would I suggest uh, that there's a, a financial motive behind behind that. I'm sure we can clarify. Okay. Uh, I, 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 very briefly, thanks, Kavina, and my apologies to Mr. Harvey uh, for keeping him waiting. Um, the thing I'm struggling with a little is that you know, what incentive is there for, say, for instance, the chambers? To, to use the SDI, UKTI, uh, in taking forward our trade missions. Because, you know, f from their perspective, why not just do it on their own? And then they've got their branding, uh, uh, you know, if they look at the sort of sectoral area. I mean, why, why would they come to SDI? I mean, what incentive would there be? Well, the incentive previously for SCDI is well, that, that, that we were funding that, it. Through, through, so but we it knew that through it SCDI. It was a procurement arrangement. Yeah. You're, you're right. If, to be honest, if the Scottish Chambers, the Chambers Network, SCDI, wanted to do deliver their own missions, we, would, they be, do. we would be delighted. But they do do. They do do. do. <laughs> yes. they, 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 did, they did tell us when they came yes. that they do their own yes. missions. And when we asked them what involvement there was with SDI, I think the answer was was none. That's right. Mm. Could, but could I... previously, you're right. SCDI, yes, there was that sort of arrangement, uh, but now there's not. What I what I would be hoping, if they're delivering um, their own missions, is that this collaborative group, if you like, the kind of the, the pre a company going into market and afterwards, there's an opportunity. So an incentive for them would be to ensure that their members get access to other levels of support at the right at, at the appropriate time for them. And again, for us to work much more together on the the outcome for that for that business. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a bit concerned that you're using terms like hopeful. 
a comment? Yeah. The most important thing for me is how we best support our companies to access the international opportunities that they've identified. And I think, you know, our approach is to work with UKTI to look at where they are taking missions and, and, and exhibitions, not to duplicate, but to support our companies to access their uh, trade missions. And similarly for any other organization. And what we want to do, I won't say hope to do, what we want to do is have that single calendar of trade missions for Scotland, for Scottish-based companies. And it's really important that we have trade missions that are strong, that have the right companies, that can make the right connections in market, make an impact, not who's running them. Okay, all right, thanks. In view of the time, we, we need, to, need, to, need to move on. Um, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, convener. Can I apologise to the committee and the witnesses for being a few minutes late at the start of the meeting? Um, a great deal of what you've talked about is um, increasing the number of Scottish businesses that are exporting, you know, expanding that as a contribution to growth and so on. One of the things green politicians bang on about endlessly and bore our colleagues to tears with is the importance of the character of economic activity rather than the amount of it and the growth of it. Um, and I wonder if I could raise some questions about the issues which a newly internationalising business in Scotland may encounter for the first time and how your organisations engage with them. Obviously there'd be issues around legal compliance with a different jurisdiction, but beyond legality there's a wider ethical context. Um, I think uh, Mr Francis mentioned uh, China, India and the Middle East. These are all areas where there would be serious concerns around uh, issues like human rights and labour standards in the supply chain. Uh, issues around uh, discrimination, including illegal discrimination, which would leave uh, an employee who was sent to one of these uh, areas to ex explore the, the, the newly emerging business opportunities there, facing levels of discrimination which are not just uncomfortable but positively unsafe. Uh, there'd obviously be uh, an environmental aspect to these, these concerns uh, around the, the need to, um, as, uh, as SCDI wrote in one of their uh, one of their documents to to remember the uh, uh, the burden on the the planet's resources peaking and the pressure on the global commons from emissions to water scarcity. In discussing that with STDI at a previous meeting, I was reminded how easy it is to write these things down and how difficult it is to actually follow through with that in practice. Could you tell me what practical steps your organisations take to uh, proactively engage and to encourage businesses to? Uh, engage in a very conscious level with these ethical dimensions that they will be encountering as they begin to internationalise? So one of the things that we do do is in advance of taking companies to market, we have uh, we have sessions before they go as well as in market um, where we uh, look at, so the FCO for example has got a lot of good um, ad advice in terms of human rights and, and, and legalities and that kind of thing, we share, we share that. We also obviously have our people in market that work with the companies both before and during, you'll have seen some of that in um, the members that were in, in Saudi Arabia um, uh, and in in addition to that, I don't know what else we do. I've, I've, I think it's a really important thing, and I think what we need to do is continue to build that level of expertise with our own staff so that they can properly advise the companies. And part of our approach for those three markets that you mentioned is to have market desks based in Scotland. And clearly, they will have a deeper knowledge of the business environment and some of the issues that uh, you alluded to. Uh, and it's important that we build that expertise within our own staff so that they can have the conversations with businesses. And I think, you, you know, the UK's uh, position, as you will know, is all about uh, implementing fully the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And that's something we would proactively support. But beyond that, I think in, in all of the support we give to companies across what international or other, we expect people to have the 
kind of reflect the the kind of uh, what's the word the the ethical and the moral position of that we are developing as a country in relation to these issues as well. So, for example, could you could you give me an example of a a, a form of economic activity that you would not be keen to support uh, if, for example, uh, it didn't meet uh, our domestic environmental standards, but did meet uh, somebody else's lower standards? No, not off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I, I'm not hugely surprised, and I, I reflect again on the experience with SCDI where words on paper can sound strong, but action doesn't always follow through. What we tend to do across all, all the, the kind of business support activities that we do is that we, we aim to comply with both government policy and legality, and we, we tend not to take kind of moral and ethical stances on things um, f from that kind of broader, broader perspective. And not take moral or ethical stance? Yeah, we would take legal and political policy. We would use political policy and a legal stance in terms of what we would invest in. Is it reasonable for an organisation which is on behalf of all of us, on behalf of us as a society, engaging with these issues, simply not to take an ethical stand? We would take an ethical stance where it was government policy to do so. Yeah, that's kind of rare as well, isn't it? But it, it, may, it would make it quite difficult for us to take decisions because you know, what one person would, would think of as, as being a, a good opportunity, someone else might, might disagree. So it, it does become, mm. you're, you're absolutely correct, it becomes very, very difficult um, to, to embed that across all, all our investment decisions. I wonder if Mr Warrington has anything to add on this. Um, if you go overseas, I mean, we do not, you know, a lot of people travel overseas and do trade work without ever having any contact with the British government whatsoever, and that's just a fact of life, and that will happen. Um, if you uh, participate in a UKTI trade mission or you get a briefing at the British Embassy on trade matters, there are certain things that we will discuss with you. Um, we will always discuss with you the issues around bribery and corruption, and we will always discuss with you, as, as has been mentioned, the issues around human rights. I mean, what about something where uh, perhaps, you know, less difficult to deal with where uh, a, an organisation, a company uh, which is having to send some of its employees to a, a new market that it's starting to get involved in, where those employees might not be safe on grounds of their religion, on grounds of their sexuality, on grounds of gender uh, or disability. W what kind of support do you give to those companies to um, address well, that, those that questions? That becomes a consular issue. Um, it just sort of slightly falls into a different part of the organisation. Um, I, you know, I can I, I speak unofficially on behalf of the Foreign Office and the Consular Service because I'm here to speak UKTI. But no, we do advise companies on those sorts of issues as well. But it would be the Foreign Office doing that as a consular issue rather than UKTI doing it as a trade issue. So, so you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't have any approach to encouraging a company to uh, consider those issues ahead of time. You would you would simply expect a, a consular service to engage with individual cases if they arose. Depends what you mean ahead of time. Um, you know, if someone was thinking of investing uh, in a country and they were thinking of bringing large amounts of people out, we would discuss with them, you know, the issues around that in terms of the full range of consular issues, which may be around, uh, you know, gender or, 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 or sexual orientation. You know, because there are countries where that, that, that's a real issue, um, but also around just personal safety, security, the whole range of issues. But um, it, it's not an automatic. Thing it, it would be if we had interface with that company, where we would discuss it. We would, we would always seek FCO advice if we were going to be taking a mission, for example, out to um, a country where there, there may be risks or security. In fact, we would tend not to do it, but we, we would always seek advice from, from FCO in advance of, of going out to market. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm conscious of the time. I've got three members who don't want to come in, so we'll try and uh, try and get through them if we can. Um, start with Richard Lyle. No. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, Scot Scottish Development uh, International, SDI, is a joint venture which includes Scottish Government and Scottish Enterprise Island, Islands Business Gateway, Talent Scotland, Daddy Daddy Da. Um, actually, Mr Francis, your budget is £35.1 million, pounds, uh, up from... 26.6 million in 2010-11. You've done a lot of good work. Over 2,700 con uh, companies accessed international markets. 29% increase in the year before. Your figures in cash terms have went up 32%. 
are you giving value for money? That's my first question. And what's your view in regards to the Wilson Review when he said that we should have uh, a e export Scotland rather than a collective across uh, all the other companies I've just mentioned? So are we uh, delivering value for money? I think we are. I think our uh, evidence base is strong on the performance and, and the value for money aspects of it. I think you need to take into account uh, when you look at value for money on the scale of the challenge you're trying to address. And I think we have mentioned uh, earlier uh, today uh, the long-term nature of improving the total number of exporters, not simply from Scotland but from the UK, and how this uh, does require persistence, passion and determination. So I think we, we are uh, very strongly focused on, 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 on that, uh, but it, it, it will take resources, so, so we need to devote the appropriate level of resources to that. I think as Jane has, has mentioned several times today, if other partners are in a position to deliver things, if the market failure has corrected and the private sector will will step in and do it without any further uh, support from the public sector, then that's a very positive outcome from, from our perspective. So I hope that answers your first question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll come back again to Export Scotland, but you're saying resources. SDI have nearly 30 offices, 260 staff. UKTI has 160 offices with 1,200. You know, at the end of the day, um, you know, I... <laughs> I, I, st I believe that you are working together. I, I, I don't believe that you're, 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 there's a bit of the, the big brother mentality. I, I'm, I'm certainly not going to reflect, reflect that. But is there not a case for more? Uh, I, I had the experience of being on a, a, a trade mission paid for by the Taiwanese government uh, to Taiwan and, and met uh, one of your excellent uh, operatives, oh, Reggie Wu, um, over there. And, and basically... Uh, with the greatest respect, he was suggesting there wasn't enough of him around, uh, you know, uh, trying to capture, you know, and, and you've got a lot of people who are doing a lot of good work, but can we, you know, should we have more people located within some of the UKTI offices or the embassies, you know, and not just concentrate where's the, where's the, a, a great, great markets in China and India uh, and, uh, and America, there, there's other opportunities out there. Are we capturing those other opportunities? So I, th I, I think two answers to your question. We've got 29 offices in 18 countries and we select our offices based on that analysis I mentioned earlier of understanding our sector priorities with the market opportunities. So what we do is with the resources we have, we put them in the areas that we think we can get the best return for our companies. Clearly, eh, there are opportunities in lots of other markets for our, com uh, our companies, and that's w where we rely on and do get the support for our companies that's required from our UKTI network in the 150-odd countries or 150 offices that they have internationally. Your question about do we have the right level of uh, Scottish resources internationally then, you know, that's a kind of an open question. You could always do with more. Our job principally is to ensure we get best value, the best return for the resources we do have. And what do you think about uh, Brian Wilson's comment that we should have a, 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 a Export Scotland brand? So, uh, I think I come back to the points that have already been made. It's all about trying to say, so what are you trying to overcome? If the issue is access to services, I think we've had a lot of discussion around that. And whilst we can always do a better job with our partners, I think there's strong evidence to say customers are getting access to the right services from the right organization 
at the right time. Uh, in terms of whether he means it's an internal brand or an external brand, I'm not sure. Uh, I think, you know, we are clear that Scotland has to have a very clear international narrative about what Scotland stands for. And I think, you know, uh, that narrative based around the premium nature, the provenance of, of the things, the integrity, all of that's working well in the marketplace. But I'm not sure if that answers your question. I, I, my, my view on this is I, we've, we've worked very hard over the past few years to try to build up the SDI brand in Scotland as, as being that, that kind of vehicle, if you like. If there was the opportunity to accelerate alignment, to make it much easier that all of us, chambers and everybody delivered under Export Scotland as a brand, then I would be very open to that. I guess it's what's going to be, as Neil said, what's actually going to be the most effective. I don't think a single organisation, Export Scotland, would be the approach because I think we actually need the partnerships. We need everybody working together and collaborating in order to achieve the, the, the impacts that we want to see and the very stretching ambitions that we've got. And, and lastly, if you allow me, convener, um, you were asked, you were asked earlier about um, you know people getting together and nobody being the chairman. Mr. Francis, who's your immediate boss? Anne McCall. Sorry. Anne McCall, okay. chief executive of Scottish Development International. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We, we, we are at the end of our time, but I promised Gordon Macdonald I would let him back in, so I'll let Gordon. In. My apologies to Lewis and Chick. I just don't think, don't think we have time. But, but, but Gordon Macdonald. Uh, I just want to ask the questions that uh, I, we had agreed at the beginning to do with the Smart Exporter Programme, but I've cut them down to a couple. So my, my first is, you very helpfully at the beginning highlighted um, the number of companies that have had some form of support, either from SDI or UKTI or both. Uh, and I think from memory it was just under about 5,000 companies. But what was the target that you wanted of no, number of companies that you wanted to support when the smart programmer, uh, smart exporter program, was launched, and how many companies have actually went on to be um, active exporters out of that number that you supported? So, so, so two things there. Uh, our our targets don't tend to really relate to specific programs, but in terms of that, what we call that strategic target in in Scotland's trade and investment strategy that was launched in 2010 I think uh, there was a target of 8,000 to 10,000 companies now we've got one more year of the strategy left it finishes uh, in a year's time uh, and we are just at this moment in time when we close out the performance at the end of March will be just over the 8,000 so we're in the target range with one year to go. Your question then about what have we seen in terms of uh, companies moving along. Remember I described that journey, the phases that the companies have to go through. How many of them have got to becoming uh, exporters? We don't have that information right now. We will track that through and, and, and understand that. Uh, and I think uh, the, the Smart Exporter Programme was funded uh, jointly with the European Social Fund. So its focus was on skills and building capacity and capability and it wasn't focused on specifically on achieving new exporters. One of the learning points we've taken, as I said, in launching our new programme is our focus is very much on achieving new exporters. So that's one of the big changes we've made. So my, my last question, question was going to be on the new programme you've just launched and you've explained some of the difference there, but what will be the measure of success on that new programme? So it's new exporters. How many companies have we taken from being... There's some technical things, so, so we are calling it new or passive, so companies that currently have zero international sales or less than 15% of their total revenues from international sales. Our, that's our target, is to, to increase that number. So, by, uh, by how much? Uh, 
I will I will confirm in writing in due course. I think it is by four hundred a year, but I will I might be completely wrong. So can I please confirm that, uh, convener? Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, my my apologies to the other two members who want to come back in, but we're going to have to. To, to cut it now. Uh, we, we've a lot of other business to get through this morning. Can I thank you all for coming along this morning? It's been a very useful session to us, and we're grateful to you for your time. Uh, we'll now have a short suspension to allow a changeover.
Okay, if we can uh, reconvene, I'd like to welcome uh, James Withers, Chief Executive of Scotland Food and Drink. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Um, I think um, you've heard actually most of the uh, evidence we had from the, the previous session. Um, I think one of the things I think the committee would be interested to get from your perspective as, as the leader of a, a trade industry that's very focused on exporting is um, what your take is on this question of the relationship between UK TI and SDI, which we heard a lot about in the previous panel. Um, clearly there is a, a, an ambition to have collaborative working. Um, Given what we've heard, the, 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 there's a lot being done to try and make sure that there's a, a seamless offer to Scottish companies. But what's, what's your perspective on how this works in practice? Um, I think it's probably a mixed bag, to be honest. So I, I think about the collaboration that is here and then the collaboration that is out in the field in overseas markets. Um, and out in overseas markets, I've seen it worked really well. We, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, we were in India uh, a year and a half ago, and the and the UKTI team and the SDI team and the Delhi Embassy work effectively as one team, and that works really well. Um, I think here, to be honest, if you were asking the companies and companies that are members of ours, um, they would say it's better. Um, Yes, yeah. yeah. So it's an upward, It's definitely an upward trajectory. I think the principle of having SDI as being the lead delivery vehicle for trade and investment in Scotland is the right one, um, but we're not there yet. So you'll see UKTI delivered events um, happening in Scotland. Um, interestingly, I got an email uh, this morning inviting me to, uh, to encourage Scottish companies to take part in a webinar about how they can use the British brand to increase their uh, traction in international markets, which is, a, is not quite where we are in terms of what the Scottish approach is. So there's still um, bits of friction there. We had a trade mission back in 2012, uh, SDI and Scotland Food and Drink joint trade mission, and then UKTI decided to organise one at the same time, going to the same market, asking the same companies. Um, now, that was three years ago. I don't think that would happen now, and the reason I don't think it would happen now is because there's a lot more uh, joined-up discussion around the operating plans. Um, it didn't used to be an issue if you went back probably five years ago because, to be honest, I don't think UKTI were that interested in food and drink. It wasn't a big priority for them. It's now become a bigger priority for them. So they sort of have jumped into the area, which meant we there was an initial duplication, I think, but as greater understanding has developed, I think that's lessening. It's not a perfect story yet, but it's lessening. And I think the answer is that in terms of the delivery of activity, SDI should be the face of that activity, working in partnership with with industry organisations here rather than UKTI. Okay. We were discussing earlier the whole question of, of trade missions. Um, I mean, what is your sense or your or, or your member sense in terms of the offer that's available from trade missions? Um, you know, we heard from SDI they they clearly organise uh, particular trade missions tend to be sectorally focused. We heard in previous evidence sessions that uh, SCDI, who would previously uh, organised them under some arrangement with the UKTI have, have, are no longer doing that. Uh, Scottish Chambers of Commerce told us that they themselves organise trade missions completely independently of uh, uh, SDI or, or other organisations. What was, was your experience of trade missions? Um, trade missions are absolutely critical. There's no doubt they make a huge uh, impact and the value of having companies getting out of Scotland and seeing the market is is difficult to put a price on. And we've seen um, two big benefits. One, an increase in exports from them, but two, probably more importantly, a new culture of collaboration developed between the companies that go on them together. And, and for food and drink, that's really important. There are lots of folk that do trade missions. You say you've mentioned SCDI and others. Um, you know, we work with the likes of Santander. They do their own trade missions. You've got private sector banks and lawyers and accountants that all do trade missions as well. We've tried to really focus, and we just work through SDI as, as, as the partner that, that we use. But the ways of working have changed. So what we've tried to do as an industry leadership body is say, based on research and work, these are the markets we're interested in. Um, we've now got a single strategy as to what those markets are and what we want to do. And the next phase, which is just getting finalised at the moment, is having a single annual operating plan. So there is a very clear plan each year of set trade missions, which shows we'll go to when we'll bring inward missions of buyers into Scotland, which actually is, is proving more valuable than just uh, companies going out. And that becomes the focus of it. OK. But and I get the impression from what you said is there is still, would there still be, in your view, too much duplication? in terms of what's on offer? I think, to be honest, though, a lot of that duplication, I wouldn't 
point the finger at the public sector uh, as an industry and the private sector is pretty disorganised around this as well. So you have banks and law firms and accountancy bodies all trying to do trade missions as well. Um, we've taken the approach that um, you know, if there's another private sector organisation doing trade mission, then you know they can give us the detail. But we're going to work through a very clear set with with SDI. So I don't, I, the, I've not seen the same kind of that that sort of China Japan trade mission example I mentioned, with both UKTI and SDI doing it at the same time in the same place, looking for the same companies. Uh, I've not seen that repeated in the last uh, two years, and I don't think it would happen now. Okay. All right. Thanks. I'll bring in Dennis Roberts. Uh, thank you, Convener, uh, and good morning. It's um, 81% of your funding comes from the, your members, from the private, and you've got 19% coming from Scottish Enterprise. If there was a shortfall from your members in the private sector, would uh, Scottish Enterprise uh, meet that shortfall? Um. That's an interesting question. I suppose it might be worth reflecting on the journey we've been on. So we were pump primed by Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Enterprise and Scottish Government. So that ratio of 80-20 was completely the other way around back in 2007 when we were set up. So the public sector, as a kind of leap of faith into this industry leadership model, said we're going to support this, but if you're worth your salt and you're delivering, then industry should be paying for you. So we've been on a journey of increasing private sector income. So we've gone from a position of being as I say, very much 80% public sector funded to 80% private sector funded. Um, why is that important to us? Because it's important we're an industry-led body. Uh, by having companies who pay a voluntary membership to us, I suppose, keeps us real in terms of what we're doing. If we're not delivering for the industry, then they'll not pay us support uh, and we won't uh, continue. Um, if there's a shortfall now... Um, I'm not sure they would, and I'm not sure they should. And what I would say, though, is we're about to move into a new... Uh, public sector funding partnership with Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Enterprise and Scottish Government, which will be an increase of funding for our industry coordination and leadership work. And the same side, we're going to try and build our private sector income uh, at the same time. Good. In terms of the, uh, I mean, obviously, <coughs> whisky uh, it accounts for quite a, a large, you know, a huge percentage of the export market, about 80%, I think. Um, in terms of the SMEs uh, within your membership, how influential are they within your um, moving forward in terms of the, your, your planning, that sort of strategic planning? Um, critical. So I, I heard the other evidence session and there was um, questions about account management and that kind of process. That tends to, whilst hearing the point about it's not based on just turnover and growth perspective, the reality is that there's 200, roughly 200 account managed food and drink companies um, and most of them are of the larger, the large scale. So we are, see ourselves very much as needing to engage with the SME end. Now, 80% of food and drink companies operating in Scotland employ less than 10 people. So that's, you know, even before the S of SM, SME, you know, really early stage. So um, for us, engaging at that end is going to be critical, giving them a voice in what the structure looks like, and increasingly the answer to the scale question, because we need scale for exports, but it's not scale achieved by big companies swallowing up small or even s smaller companies merging into one. It's this collaboration approach. So how can we take 18 small food and drink producers in Argyle and Hans Hans and have them working collectively to share shipping containers and share um, business development managers overseas? That's the That collaboration piece will be key. So the SME bit is, is really the bread and butter of the industry. Well, the sort of micro companies in, in yeah. some respects if we're going you know, l l uh, s smaller than small. Um, uh, I mean, some of them, they, they have the potential to uh, go into the export market too. Uh, how, yeah. how, how do you nurture that at the moment? Um, I suppose if we, if we went back three or four years, it was about ambition. So it was about, um, for smaller companies, thinking beyond just their local market, which I suppose was their, their bread and butter and will remain the foundation of their business for a while. Um, that battle to get smaller companies to be ambitious um, has been won, I would say, and won with enough... On the evidence, they said it's really difficult to get that ambition. That's hard work. They, they, they were suggesting that it's not. Uh, my perspective is it's won with enough 
companies in food and drink that can now be worked with. I think if we won it with another 500, we've got you know almost a body that's too big to work with just now. Um, and so I, maybe to give you an example, Aaron is probably used an example quite a lot. You have 11 or 12 producers formed Taste of Aaron there and now now selling cheese in the Burj Al Arab in Dubai and, and elsewhere. Um, I think Neil referred to a collaborative export pilot the SDI have led taking 18, 19 companies through a UK uh, consolidator. So if you look... Um, uh, there are 12 companies just flying back from Boston just now from the seafood show, and there'll be another 15 going to Hong Kong in May. Most of them are SMEs. They're small craft brewers. They're rapeseed oil producers. Um, and for us, in terms of Scotland, we're very clear that if you want mass volume production at a low cost, don't come to us. But if you want artisan quality uh, and a good, strong brand that's built around provenance, that's what we can do. So for us, the, it's almost the smallest, beautiful piece in terms of the, the brand. That's excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, Lewis MacDonald. Yeah, President. The previous evidence session, uh, there was a little bit of uh, exploring of the issue of cross-sectoral work, and uh, we heard very clearly from SDI their focus on single sector work. Within the work that you promote on trade missions and elsewhere, do you tend to work across the food and drink area or do you subsector in terms of your focus? In other words, salmon and whiskey and the other things that are export clearly have different markets but also sometimes the same ones. Yeah, they do. So the the export strategy we've now got in place, which I would stress is not a whiskey strategy. They've sort of been there, done that, and we're, we're working with them in a different way. It's about non-whisky uh, drinks and food. Um, and the driving principle has been about where is the cross-sectoral opportunity. So the 15 markets that we've identified, and then the top seven, which is where new specialists have been put on the ground with funding from industry and SDI and Scottish Government Ministers, that's about the cross-sectoral opportunity. Now, we spent a while doing that, the guts of a year, identifying what those markets should be. Um, but it was around where the ambition and the opportunity for red meat crossed over with bakery, with salmon and seafood. Um, so it's very much a cross-sectoral push. So in Boston at the reception on Monday night, it's a seafood show, but at the reception they'll do, will have craft beer and have other products there. Um, and our way of working is that if my counterpart is the head of Seafood Scotland, when he's at an event, he's also now wearing a red meat hat and a bakery hat, for, uh, so to speak. Um, so it's very much cross-sectoral. I think the next phase for us will be, be thinking cross-sectoral beyond food and drink. So where do our ambitions cut across tourism, textiles, life sciences and elsewhere? That'll be, that's the next phase, I think. That, and in a sense, that was my next question, okay. was if, if, if that's how you work and it makes sense to have different products and different companies working together within a, a strategic approach, is there a point at which the SDI's insistence on a sectoral approach could get in the way? Um, in other words, and, and if it does, would you then look to a Chamber of Commerce or some other partner to, to promote across a range of products? Yeah, the sectoral approach um, we've been really insistent on, actually. So um, we've said, as an, we've tried to pull industry together so we can decide on what are the absolute key priorities and be, be clear on that as opposed to, I suppose, asking for a hundred different things. But we've demanded a really strong sectoral approach. So SDI probably historically has been an organisation of generalists. Um, and, you know, GPs are fine, but sometimes you need consultants. And we've been really keen to have food and drink specialists that know um, the food and drink sector. Um, why do we want to do that? Because we've seen the Irish and the New Zealanders and the Scandinavians do it for years and we know it works. Um, so in some ways, we've, cr we've, we've demanded a greater specialism and credit to SDI, they've responded to that. Um, but I think the next phase will be looking at where this cross-sectoral bit comes in. Now, we know that the same markets we're trying to sell food and drink products to are the same markets that Visit Scotland and the Scottish Tourism Alliance are trying to attract visitors from, are also the same markets that we've got overseas students coming from. So this, um, whether it's Team Scotland, One Scotland, whatever the phrase is, this idea of better cross-sectoral work and I think will be is what the next phase of our journey looks like. And, and, and very briefly, and I, I appreciate it's the next phase, but what, what might that look like, given, given your strong uh, support for a sectoral approach, how do you get beyond that at the point yeah. that you're ready to go? There's probably two parts. I think it's operationally. So if we're at, um, with SDI, if we're at Gulf Food, the big um, food and drink show in Dubai, 
and Visit Scotland are thinking about a promotion in the Middle East to encourage visitors in the Mall of the Emirates while we do that at the same time. But I think it might start looking like physical presences as well. So um, in Shanghai, for example, there's New Zealand House. Um, they have their consulate and, and embassy, as, as, as I would understand it, but they then have effectively a business embassy. And that place is a showcase for their tourism, their food and drink, uh, their further education sector. Um, and I know SDI are and Scottish Enterprise are looking at that, I'd like to think that if we were really careful about which markets we chose, we could think about a physical presence as well, which could be a hub for businesses to use in markets, but also be a showcase and a place we bring uh, buyers into as well. Thanks very much. Okay, um, Gordon. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, last year, the Scottish whisky industry saw its um, value and volume of exports fall. How is the rest of the food and sector, the food and drink sector doing uh, is it achieving its targets and does it require any additional support in order to achieve its targets? Um, yeah, so, so the drink sector were down about, I think, 300 million uh, on the latest 2014 figures that came out three weeks ago. Uh, food uh, was up 3.5%, um, which was about the UK uh, level on average. Um, now, the, the, the whiskey's view is it's a blip along the road and, and my uh, sense is they're, they're right on that uh, but food is still on an upward trajectory but we're talking about obviously a lower base so as, as, as Dennis mentioned if you look at the 5.1 billion in food and drink that we'll export or we exported last year, 78% of that is whiskey. Now food's gone from 700 million to 1.1 billion so up 52-53% um, and our ambition is to have that doubled over a decade so we want to hit 1.4 billion in food exports but we felt to answer your question, we needed more support. And that was the principle of, of putting this new strategy in place. Um, so we also felt that industry should probably have some skin in the game. So rather than just saying, we want to do this and government pay for it, please, um, a number of industry bodies, five of us, have put uh, around about £400,000 onto the table, match funded by SDI, with government ministers um, putting in the gap funding to fund these new specialists and that's what we felt was the support required. So at the moment, no more beyond that because that's just getting going. The new specialists, four of them are recruited. There's another four that should be in place in the next few months. Uh, I'm comfortable that's what um, we need at the moment. Actually, the priority just now was to make sure that those specialists on the ground are run off their feet. In other words, there are enough companies in Scotland demanding their services and going out to, to market. And in terms of SDI and UKTI, um, what, what works well in terms of the support that you get from them and what needs improvement? Um, I, I'll comment on SDI. UKTI is a much more, um, I suppose, mysterious beast to me. Uh, we don't, we have very little contact with UKTI um, and that's probably as much because uh, we don't seek it as much as them seeking us out. So we, we work through um, SDI. What support works well? Um, I think these specialists could have a transformational impact, is my view. Um, and what works well in those markets is hiring in local knowledge. So we've got plenty of people that understand Scotland and the food and drink industry in SDI. We need the post in Hong Kong to be, or the post in Shanghai or Singapore, to be someone that brings in that local market knowledge that understands that distributive framework. So we need more of that, and we've been weak on that historically, I think. Uh, and the US would probably be a good example where we've been weaker in terms of our relationships in that market, but I think that will strengthen now with new specialists and actually a restructure of the SDI um, team there. Um, what works well here? Um, I think it's understanding where companies are in the customer journey um, and being flexible about that. So it's no longer a measurement of the size of a company as to whether they should be account managed or whether they should be in smart exporter or not. Um, we need to move more flexible about that. I think the other thing that's going to have to be changed is the enterprise agencies, as I think they recognise, are going to learn how are going to learn how to manage or have to learn how to manage collaborations of groups of companies. It's easy to account manage a company. It's a bit more complex to account manage a collaboration of companies. We're going to have to learn how to do that in Scotland, I think, given the, the SME base. Um, I, I heard um, discussion earlier of the sort of one door, any door, one stop shop type idea. Um, we've tried to do that in food and drink. There's a you know a single phone number, a single email address for any food and drink company who's interested in exports. Um, but there's always more work to do to make sure they get to the right uh, answer. My final question is just basically, you said the importance of understanding local markets and having that local knowledge. 
How, you know, what engagement have you had with the Global Scott Network and how successful was it? Um, I'd say that's a mixed bag as well. So there are, um, you know, there's a lot of Global Scots. I think it's 600, 700. Um, we need to be clear what we're asking of them. So they can carry a card carrying a Global Scot and there's an element of pride in that and it's really important. Um, but we need to be clear what we want from them. And from my point of view, um, I'm interested in the 30 that could really do something for food and drink as opposed to maybe the other 670 who might not. And those individuals might not be in the food and drink sector, but they might be in a particular market that's important to us. Uh, so I think we can we can probably use that asset maybe more than we have done before. And I think there's good examples of how the Irish Irish models and New Zealand models that use that um, very well. But it's an important part of it. And because we have limited resources, SDI have limited resources, the industry has limited resources, we need to use the much broader network. The one thing Scotland has is the most amazing expat community. We really need to use that. OK, thanks very much. Thanks. OK, um, Richard Lyle. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good morning. Um, have you ever had any of your companies ever complain that SDI have not given them the help that they wanted? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> we've got 350 companies, I think, and um, I haven't met a sector that wouldn't have uh, folk that would complain about um, SDI or indeed anyone else. Um, so, yes, we've had complaints about uh, SDI. I think it would be fair to say the general picture is a huge amount of value attached to that SDI resource. The job, I think, from an industry point of view is to help them deliver better. So our, our approach from an industry point of view is rather than sit here and say, um, you know, you should be doing that and that and you're not doing that and here's the, you know, this is where, this is our complaint of where you're failing. Our view is it's actually our responsibility to set the framework ourselves. And then our ask is that the public sector aligns behind that. So the industry leadership, public sector alignment. So we've, you know, our criticisms have been not enough specialism. We're not good enough in the US. Um, and so we've said that our view how we could do it. We're willing to help fund that if we can. Um, and then they've reacted to that. The general picture is good, but yeah, there's all the complaint here. So, yeah, right, I'm one of your companies. I complain to you. How soon can you, can you phone up? Neil Francis and say, Neil, I want to have a meeting tomorrow. Uh, Joe Bloggs' company's phoned me up about da 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 Can uh, How soon would you get that? I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have a single complaint about access. Uh, we probably wouldn't meet. We'd just talk about it on the phone and we'd get one of their Glasgow team to speak to the company involved. Or I would speak directly to the field right. officer, one of my colleagues. So you get, you get in instant access and, and, and your problem solved if, if somebody's giving you a complaint. A problem addressed. Problem addressed, yeah. not maybe problem yeah. solved. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, there's a willingness to, yeah, to do it. I would have no complaints about that yeah, at all. Uh, we, are, we all live in the real world. Yeah, yes. indeed. Um, what do you think about the, uh, Brian Wilson's uh, view in regards to setting up an Export Scotland brand? Or, you know, like a, uh, what used to be a bit before your time, the old Board of Trade sort of situation? Yeah, and, you know, we've looked at the Irish model, Board Beer, which is. Um, you know, a single a single food board there. As, whereas in Scotland, we have a seafood body, a red meat body, a, a bakery body, and uh, different enterprise agencies in different parts of the country, and the trade investment arm as well. Um, I, I'm not, a, I'm personally not a fan of the of the Irish model because it's a purely public sector solution. It's Quango led, whereas I think what we do in Scotland or should do in Scotland is about industry leadership. Um, I, I think if I'm being really honest, I'm less excited about big structural change than I, than I am about getting the existing structure to work well together. And I think my, my limited experience of structural change is that you lose two years with everyone defending the structure they're in as opposed to actually doing the doing. So I'm much more interested in, in how you get the existing agencies to work better. So um, I, I, I've looked at the Export Scotland idea um, and, you know, it's interesting, but I'm not sure it looks like a solution to the problem we have in Scotland. So it's basically get on with Get on with what we're good at. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kenyon. Thank you. Uh, Jake Brody. Good afternoon. Hi, Jake. Hi. I think the first thing I'd like to say is hallelujah. <laughs> at least we have somebody with, you know, with success, with clarity as to what we should have, which is an industry-led set of organisations in Scotland. Where does government get in the way of what you want to do? Um, so, okay, so where do we hit hurdles? 
We hit hurdles if the old culture comes back. And by that I mean government decides it's got an idea and bashes on and decides to do something and create something new um, without recognising that we're trying to develop this new relationship of, of, of industry leadership. Um, so you have a brainstorming session, enterprise agency decide we've got a gap here and particularly let's, let's run off and do it without it um, understanding what's happening in the round and understanding actually whether industry wants it. Um, but my experience has been, and I would say this right from devolution is that the the level of accessibility and ability to think of the public sector as a partner rather than a body over there that needs to be lobbied has completely transformed now it's been on a journey and it's taken a while for us to get there but government undoubtedly will get in the way at times and i have no doubt that government will say industry will get in our way as well but I think we now have an ability to be quite honest about where that happens and address it. So, you know, there, there, there's probably the example where it happens, but I'm confident there's now a framework where we can generally address that. Um, Using your example, James, of, of New Zealand House, for example, and, and other, sec, other industry-led sec, uh, uh, organisations like uh, the Scottish Tourism Alliance, and I'm not, you know, I, I, I did become a bit concerned when you said that we're, we're going to look at spreading our, you know, the, the, the sectors that we cover. I mean, do you feel that there's a lack of clarity in the role of Scotch Enterprise, HIE, SDI, in terms of being a facilitator, part funder, and being an operational unit? I mean, you talk about selling. I mean, government shouldn't be selling. You you guys know the, the, the sectors. So... That's what I'm trying to get to. This. What, what, do, do, you say you don't understand. Do they understand the role? Is it specified properly? Uh, I mean, we've seen what's happened to other organisations. Like, well, pinpoint is CDI, but if I may use that just as an example of pulling industries together, which, frankly, I don't know, it works. I mean, expertise has to be centred on a particular sector and industry. It's, an, it's a really interesting question, I, and... and I'm not sure exactly what the answer is. Suffice to say that it is important that the enterprise agencies see themselves as enablers. So their job, and to some extent the job of industry leadership bodies, is to create the best possible operating environment. So not to do the doing, but to create the environment for companies to, to flourish. Um, and that means then that the company's responsibility is to do the, the, the delivery of the selling. I do think, though, it's important we don't... Um, box ourselves in or the the enterprise agencies and SDI don't box themselves too much in the view that we don't do commercial activity so I'll give you an example of that um, in Dubai we had a company that was been to the show the big exhibition the first time and loads of people looking to buy the product but didn't have a distributor someone to actually do that that connection between the buyer at one end and the, and the company here and bring it in um, UKTI were able um, because partly because of, of good resource, to give them a list of five distributors that they knew well that had worked with other companies that had a track record. Um, and that was dynamite for the company involved. The, the SDI view at the time there was, well, we don't get involved in that. You need to go and find your distributor. That's a commercial relationship. I think that's where actually sometimes a blurring a line could be quite important. And when they blur the line, someone will step over it and someone will get in trouble for it. But you know, actually that risk is worth it. So my view of these, these new specialists is about doing a bit more of that. Being able to say to a company new into the market who desperately needs confidence to be able to operate has heard probably a hundred scare stories of getting with the wrong partner to be able to do a bit of that work as well. So sometimes that, that whilst on the one hand, a very clear view that they set the operating environment and then it's company's responsibility to take advantage, but a blurring of that line uh, occasionally could be of merit, I think. Okay, one very brief question. We, we discussed before the consolidation of, of products for onward shipment and export. I mean, how successful uh, is, is your sector doing that? It's getting better. Leave, leave, leave the big guys aside. Yeah. Um, it's getting better, um, but there's more to be done. So we're better at it within the UK. If you're trying to get into the London market, there's now quite good consolidators uh, that will pull product together and get them into a single van. Um, but you, you know, and part of that is actually 
we see as a responsibility of our organisation to put companies in touch with each other. Someone's got a delivery and the van's coming back empty and, and do small logistics like that. The, the big step, though, we'll be thinking about that from export. So this collaborative export pilot, which is... Um, a bit of a brave new world has been saying if we can get 18 companies together that represent craft beer and jam makers and seafood and various different sectors, um, none of them are going to fill a shipping container themselves, so we need to bring them together. Using a UK consolidator um, allows them actually to sell the product to the UK, so it's still a UK sale for them, UK currency, UK regs, and then that consolidator uses its greater scale to then do the onward shipment and manages that relationship uh, with the onward buyer. So that model's just been tried. Um, we've learned some things that, you know, some distributors will work with some sectors and not others. You need to split ambient and frozen, you know, various things like that practically. But um, that model's going to work really well, I think, but it's early days. Thank you. Okay. Um, I wonder if I can ask a question on a slightly different tack about the year of food and drink Scotland 2015. Now, I know 2015 is the year in food and drink Scotland, but I know that because I'm on this committee and I take an interest in these things. I suspect if I were just a member of the public, I wouldn't have a clue. I wouldn't have heard of the year in food and, food and drink of Scotland. Well, what exactly are we doing to promote this? So it's obviously one of the tourism themed years, um, and that's been the, the focus of Visit Scotland for this year. Um, this is the second year of food and drink. The first one was either 2009 or 2010, uh, and we were told in the March of that year that it was the year of food and drink. Um, so we were told in September last year this was going to be the year of food and drink. So comparatively speaking, we, we're slightly ahead of the game. Um, I think if you were involved in um, you know, uh, youth employment or the youth agenda, it would be exciting because you know the year of Scotland's young people's 2018. Plenty of time to get planned. Food and drink tends to be in the first part of the cycle. It's felt as the easiest thing to, to do. Um, How's it been promoted? So Visit Scotland, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the adverts that have gone, and they've, they're working in, in market and country around it. And because they're working in markets where you're trying to attract visitors from, by its nature, that means there's probably work going on in America and elsewhere we're not going to see here. Um, as an industry, we've decided we, we need to try and... Uh, um, use it a bit better so we've worked with some of the major retailers um, around branding in store to help promote Scottish products um, but it's very much left unlike I suppose 2014 which is about the big flagship events um, this is about trying to have food and drink as an underlying theme in everything from a small B&B &B to Wigton Book Festival to, to, to various different other events so it's probably less visible um, but have we? Is there a perfect job being done in raising awareness? Um, probably not. Um, but that said, a few years ago we wouldn't even thought about carrying off a year of food and drink. So I'm, I'm sort of glass half full about it. Um, but I think there's much more to be done to engage the average Joe um, or Joanna on the street in, you know, in the agenda. Yeah, but, but I'm, I'm, I was interested in how we engage business because I was visiting a, a food business in Fife. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, who are involved in a very you know, customer-focused, high-end retail food business, um, and they were basically complaining that you know they would like to have adopted some of the branding for the year of food and drink, but had no information about it, and, and this would have been an opportunity for them to to you know uh, brand the business, brand the products. Twenty fifteen year of food and drink had received nothing from Visit Scotland or, or anyone else. All right, I th it's it's definitely patchy. Um, to give you some example, we decided to try and create some industry themes around it. So for each of the twelve months as a theme, this is uh, craft brewing and distilling month. Um, so a number of different businesses have, have, have got involved in that in a different way. Um, some brewers are brewing specific European drink uh, uh, beers for this month. For those of you who know, Cranachan and Crowdy, the other side of. Royal Mile Street there, every Thursday night they're doing a showcase of producers in store where customers can come in based on that theme. So um, there's some really good stuff happening, um, but it doesn't surprise me if all of you went to see 10 companies, you might find five that, uh, well, you would probably find eight that had heard of it, but you probably find five of them actually don't have the, the materials. Okay. All right. Any other points? If not, um, just falls to me to thank you, James, for Coming along this morning has been a fascinating session, and thank you for your input. Um, and at this point, we will suspend briefly and go into private session. <laughs>